Welcome to our latest book launch event in the School of Theology and Missions. We're glad to have you here with us. Uh, this has been our tradition for, I guess, this is probably our third year uh, of doing this. Each time one of our faculty members publishes a new book to give us the opportunity to hear from that author, to celebrate with them. Uh, it is a big deal uh, to finish a book and have it published. Uh, and then to give us a chance to hear about it, hear about the work, what led to it, or some of the ideas in it as the author sees fit. So, as you know from the posters, uh, we are here today to hear from Dr. Brad Green, his new book about Augustine. You might have an idea of what the cover looks like uh, there behind me. And uh, Dr. Green is a professor of theological studies here at Union uh, and has been here, I should have asked you the exact 23rd year. 23rd year here at Union. Uh, so we're blessed to have had him here this long. Many of you are in or have been in classes with him. Uh, a year ago, last week, we were doing an SDM book launch event for Dr. Green's volume in the Reformation Commentary Series. So uh, Dr. Green is doing his part in upholding this uh, event, giving us plenty of opportunities to do that. And we're grateful for his work there. Uh, he does have copies uh, of the book with him, and they are, you can purchase them afterwards for $10. You might even convince him to sign uh, your copies, so you'll have an opportunity for that afterwards, and uh, probably some time for us to ask questions at the close of this event as well. So let me leave us a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll invite Dr. Green to come to get started. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather. Some of those opportunities are limited right now, so we thank you for this. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to study your word together. We thank you for how you gift your church with teachers. And we thank you for Dr. Green. We thank you for how you've used him in the class and in writing, how you continue to do so. And uh, so we give you thanks and celebrate today this new book on Augustine, uh, another servant of yours whom you use greatly. So we ask you to use this book about him to help your church to understand what you've done in the past and help us understand how to follow you faithfully today. We ask you to bless this time and bless Dr. Green, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. Are we squared up, Mike? You good? Yep. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, have a few minutes to, to share. Uh, one of the things Augustine did is write and think on rhetoric. And one of the uh, insights of rhetoric is to know your audience. And this is the middle of November. Term papers are due. Some of you all for me. Um, and so this isn't the day for an hour and ten min minutes detailed lecture on the thought of Augustine. Uh, I know better than that. I know that if you've carved out this time, you are um, sacrificing something, a little bit of time. So thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate you uh, being here. Um, and so I, here's what I would like to do. I would like just to share a um, very brief intro to Augustine in case you don't know much about him. But that's going to be very cursory and very brief. And then I thought I'd just share how I got interested in Augustine. I think that's just probably a story worth telling for any author. I think it should be, or is of at least of interest to me, uh, how uh, I decided to uh, spend as much time as I have with Augustine. Then briefly, why Augustine matters. And then if we have time, maybe something of what I've learned throughout the process. But if you uh, are new to Augustine, he's a Western, African, North African theologian. His years were 354 to 430. Uh, he's he's uh, uh, unarguably the most important theologian of his era, particularly at least in North Africa at that time, but certainly of his era. And, un, and unarguably um, one of the most important theologians in the history of Christian thought. In one sense, to call himself an Augustinian is almost redundant uh, these days, at least in the West. Everyone kind of what most people want to be Augustine in some way, shape, or form. Um, he is shaped, his significance is that, um, is that great. 
You may know something of a story, a Christian mom, a, a pagan dad, uh, his dad uh, was known as a good dad, provided a class, we would call it classical education, so grammar, dialectic, and uh, rhetoric. Educated in North Africa and then in Rome. Famous uh, conversion story in the Garden of Milan, take and read, take and read. A long struggle with his own sin, um, and for him, particularly sexual sin, sexual lust, uh, sexual temptation, had a, um, you could say, a living girlfriend, uh, an older term as a concubine. I had to go back and forth with the editor on the book whether to retain that word. I think she allowed me to do that. Um, uh, but we would almost say a common law wife, at least that, up until recently, that would be the way we would think about his long-term girl, his woman. Um, he had a child from her, Adiodatus, which is Latin for given from God or given by God. Uh, his son would die young. His mother wanted him to um, marry a little bit higher than uh, this gal he was uh, living with. So found a got a little higher up the social status pole. Uh, but she was too young. So uh, their, their marriage had put on hold until she got of age. But by the time she got of age, Augustine had decided he was, uh, he was converted by then and remained a bachelor all of his days. And so until the day he died, he remained, uh, remained a bachelor. Augustine would end up being a pastor, or we would say a bishop, uh, in, back in Hippo in North Africa. He had a number of controversies with the Pelagians, with the pagans, with the Donatists, and I go through all that in the book. Um, probably the most significant, yeah, the three main controversies, Pelagianism, Donatism, and, uh, and uh, Paganism, uh, the three greatest controversies of his life. He's known for books like Confessions, The City of God. He wrote a book called On Christian Doctrine, which is really on the nature of rhetoric for, uh, for Christians. He will die on his deathbed, quoting the Psalms, still fighting the Pelagians on the day he died. He had an unfinished work uh, against Julian, only 600 pages, his unfinished work against Julian, that is left unfinished at his death. One scholar calls Julian a feisty redhead. Uh, you can't believe this, but I used to be a feisty redhead. Yes, he used to have hair, actually. And uh, it was red, kind of like, uh, well, actually more like Daniel's these days. But he ends up fighting Pelagianism until literally the day the day he dies. But um, I want to share how I got interested in Augustus. I think as students, uh, this might be of interest to you. When I was a PhD student in 94, started uh, at Baylor in 1994, what was all the rage was postmodernism. And that's still kind of here. And we may call it different things or whatever. But the, the, the big issue for me was um, on the nature of language or nature of words. So I was bumping up into Jacques Derrida, the French uh, philosopher, uh, Michel Foucault, another French philosopher, um, trying to make sense of postmodernism, trying to find a place to stand as a young wannabe theologian, wannabe academic in Waco, Texas in the mid-90s. And I was trying to find someone to latch on to, to wrestle with, as I was wrestling with postmodernism. So as the line went, words really can't have meaning, words are uh, only social constructs. Um, for Derrida, words just defer to other words and differ from other words, so you can never arrive at determinate meaning. So I thought, well, if I'm a Christian, I don't think that's true, but how do I speak to that? Well, I ended up taking a, a seminar, a PhD seminar on confessions. The first time I read confessions, um, it didn't really latch on to me. So if you feel guilty for not loving confessions the first time you read it, I'm with you. Uh, I didn't. Um, it was my second or third attempt that I actually finally, finally took. But what I read from Augustine that spoke to me was his books on, uh, on the teacher and on Christian doctrine. And in brief, here's why that was so important to me as, as, as a student. Is Augustine began to work out really a Christian theology of language and words and interpretation and knowledge. Um, so you've got words, 
you've got things. How do I know that this word refers to this thing? And for Augustine, it's because Christ is the teacher illumining the mind in every act of knowing. Now, I've tried to work that out and read more on that since then. But here, 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 here's how Augustine was a lifeline for me. I'm casting around as a younger student, trying to make sense of, can I really believe words have meaning? And I discovered that Augustine, some 1,600 years before Jacques Derrida, he himself was articulating a theological framework for why words matter. So if you are uh, getting into language, literary theory, uh, uh, etc., uh, go ahead and read what they assign, but then come to me and we'll read Augustine on this stuff. And I think you'll find Augustine is a lifeline to sanity on the nature of language and words. So essentially, my, my attraction to Augustine was existential and trying to find a place to stand as a theological student. And so if you are uh, wrestling with those kind of things, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk with you. But why does Augustine matter? Real briefly. Uh, number one, the centrality of grace. Uh, for Augustine, there's a priority, an efficacy, and a life-transforming nature to grace. When we respond to God in faith, that's a real response, but it's because grace came first. When we respond to God in faith, that grace which came first was also efficacious, and it elicited a response to him in faith. But also there's a life-transforming nature of grace in Augustine. So let me say something to students who are here. If you've, most of you probably come out of some sort of more traditional, um, conservative most likely, uh, setting. And um, if you're here for my honors talk, sorry, you've heard some of this before. Um, but sometimes I find for younger Christians, college age, high school, whatever, we kind of have two columns. We've kind of got the Christian obedience column, okay? And you've got the pleasure sin column. And so for many of you, many of me, or for me, we, we kind of live and try to live in this Christian duty column. We try to obey, do our duty. We kind of look longly over at the pleasure slash sin column, and we kind of take little forays, little sorties into the sin um, pleasure column, and we feel bad, you should feel bad, and you repent, you should repent, and you go back over to this little duty column, okay? So you've got the Christian life is duty, and there's an aspect of it, which is duty. So with all respects to John Piper, I love John Piper. There is an important aspect of duty in the Christian life. I suppose Piper would say that if we sat down and talked to him. But I find sometimes students wrestle with, they, they know they should obey, but they have the fun stuff over this other column, the sin pleasure column. What Augustine helps us do is see there's really just one column in life, ultimately. Well, there's two columns, but there's there's duty, obedience, and pleasure all in one column. So what, what Augustine helps us see, I think, is that what he can say is things like this. The duty begins to be something we want to do when God gives us the delight in that. It's beautiful stuff in Augustine. We begin to desire what we ought to desire when God shapes our heart such that we delight in what we ought to do. Okay. In other words, the true path of desire and joy and pleasure is the path of holiness. Now, it doesn't always feel like that in the short term. Okay, so I joke with my students. I'm glad my wife is here. So let's say I tell Diane, honey, I'm going to wash dishes tonight. Okay, it's easy to make that promise at 3 or 4 in the afternoon. But then at 7 o'clock, when the lower back is hurting or I'm tired or whatever, it might be tempting to get out of that. But hopefully, I think I do it most times, sweetie, is I go ahead and do the dishes. Now, I may not be having great delight as I do the dishes. But it is what I ought to do. And a life of duty, in the end, is the most pleasurable 
and delightful thing. So in other words, Augustine helps us think about bringing duty and delight together. Second thing is, simply the importance of the Lordship of Christ uh, in relationship to the life of the mind. So this is one of the reasons we started the school called Augustine School. Augustine is one of these persons who spoke about faith-seeking understanding, all truth being God's truth, how God illumines the mind in every act of knowing, how scientia, or science, or knowledge, should be oriented to a higher kind of knowing called wisdom, and how Christ is the one, again, who illumines the mind in every act of knowing, such that true knowing Christ is never absent from any true knowing. Okay. And we can linger more on that in the QA. But third, there's simply a God centered, eschatologically centered nature, or eschatologically focused nature of his theology. So in this book, The City of God, what's going on? We are pilgrims on a pilgrimage to the city of God. Our life in the present is oriented or shaped by where we're headed. There's an eschatological focus to our life. Again, ski into your knowledge or science leads to this greater knowledge or wisdom. And that's largely been lost in uh, our current cultural moment, to put, it, to put it mildly. Fourth, a quick word on the atonement in his, uh, in his way of thinking. Augustine writes a book called The Trinity, or De Trinitate, and Augustine, can, in books 4 and 13, has these long digressions on the atonement. Why, why does he speak about the atonement in the book on the Trinity? Well, it's because what he's doing in his book De Trinitate, or on the Trinity, is say, I already, I already believe the Trinity, the Scripture teaches it, the creeds teach it, the church teaches it, I believe the Trinity. What's this God going to be like that I'm one day going to see face to face? And so Augustine spends a lot of time working through what that God is going to be like. But he also asks the question, how do I get to one day see that God face to face? Now, Augustine had been a so-called ne Neoplatonist. We won't go into that now. But in this book, he's actually fighting against his own background in Neoplatonism. Because what he says is, is whereas the Neoplatonists essentially say you can get to God pretty much based on your own will. Augustine says no. Christ must come down, incarnation. He must die for us. And the blood of Christ must be applied to us, must transform or change us, if we're one day going to see God face to face. So this life is headed toward the face to face vision. He gets this from Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. But unlike the Neoplatonists, what Augustine says is, if I'm really going to attain that vision, I only get there because of the atoning work of Christ. In other words, I only get to heaven because Jesus has come down and died for me. And it is that death which is the only route to our ultimate end as Christians, which is the vision of God. And if you're interested in me unpacking that and the philosophy of Augustine School, it's rooted in Augustine's book, The Trinity. We only get to our ultimate destiny because of what Christ has accomplished for us, not because of what we do. So what have I learned? What have I learned? And here I'll just share briefly. I've learned that uh, you will never regret, regret spending many years engaging a, a central Christian thinker. Um, you'll never regret, so uh, I learned this from Henri Blochet. Henri Blochet is one of my mentors from afar. I've never had him for a, a professor, but he's a mentor of mine through his works. We have met him a couple times, a couple times, two, three, four times, I guess. Um, Blochet chose the uh, 20th century philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, who was more of a mainline liberal Protestant. But he chose just to read everything Ricoeur wrote to try to engage him throughout his life. Now, I. I think just because of providence, ended up choosing an ancient Christian thinker. And I don't regret it at all. Um, because when you engage one of the great Christian thinkers, you simply learn how to think theologically. Okay? But also, secondly, as a Protestant, I've really 
Sometimes people discover the church fathers and end up, and no offense to a certain student or two if they're here, I'm not picking them up. But for me, in, in, in engaging a patristic, a church father, has forced me to think, am I really going to be a Protestant or not? And if, you ha if you've had me for class, you know the answer to that question is yes, in case you are wondering. I have I remained a Protestant. But here's the situation. If you engage an ancient thinker who's not a Protestant, it forces you to come to terms with why you're not uh, uh, a Catholic, or why you're not Orthodox, and are you going to remain Protestant? So if we had time, I would unpack why I think Augustine's images of this journey back to God, even though rooted in the atonement, a Protestant, I think, needs to recast that and to rethink that so as not to lose justification by faith alone and not to lose a faith alone union with Christ. All that is to say, when you read a great pre-Reformation thinker, it forces you, if you want to remain a Protestant, to figure out really what it means to be a Protestant. Are you going to stay there? And so great to see you know I'm planning on staying. And, and staying in Baptist, just, just in case you're alone. Next, uh, I learned, uh, I think B.B. Uh, Warfield was right. B.B. Warfield said this, that the Reformation, inwardly considered, was the victory of Augustine's doctrine of grace over his doctrine of the church. And here's what Warfield was getting at there. Is that one way of grasping the Reformation is it's really a working out, we would tend to say as Protestants more consistently, a working out of Augustine's doctrine of grace over his doctrine of the church. Because certainly Augustine laid the framework for the Roman Catholic system, the Roman Catholic sacramental system. We, I do a little of that in the book. But also with this doctrine of the priority, the efficacy, of, and the efficacy and the life transforming nature of grace, I think it's clear that the Reformation saw that doctrine of grace hammered out and worked out, um, I think, quite consistently. Um, something of a tangent. If I were 22 again, or 25, looking for a PhD thesis, and I was going to do it in theology, I would probably do it on something to do with Augustine's doctrine of grace. And how in the 17th century, in France, the Jansenist, who I think were the true Augustinians of that century besides the Calvinist, within Rome, within Catholicism, the true Augustinians were the Jansenist. Rome ends up condemning the Jansenist, which is fascinating. They condemn the Jansenist, and so Pascal, who never became a Protestant, remained Catholic, but a, but a Jansenist or Jansenist friendly uh, thinker. Rome ends up condemning Jansenism, and I think, in essence, condemns the heart of Augustine's doctrine of grace. So if you want to grasp now why, when you read the Roman Catholic Catechism, I think you have a more muddled, no offense to the Roman Catholic, if you get, I think the reason you get a more muddled doctrine of grace in the Roman Catholic Catechism is because Augustine is only being followed in a very uh, ad hoc kind of way. He was, as I think, in one sense condemned in the 1600s, and Rome has never really retrieved an Augustinian doctrine of grace in their theology. But lastly, what I've learned is, even when reading great thinkers, one must have the biblical courage and fortitude to know when to disagree and to forge one's path. So, for example, on Augustine's talk of different baptism, you need to know when to disagree you know, with these things. Okay, just sorry, Stephen Jones, just having fun. <laughs> um, so that is just because Augustine said it does not mean one must embrace it. Um, and that takes a while, I think, because when you're a student, you read a great thinker and you kind of want to pretty much say they're right all down the line. Um, and so I think one thing you have to learn as, as, as a student, and if you decide to you know, stay the course and go, 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 you eventually have to have the courage to say, this is a great thinker, but I'm going to forward my own path here, and that takes a little work. So thank you very much. Happy to take questions and discuss this together. Thank you. So happy to, uh, I want to keep that 
somewhat short. I know it's a busy, um, a busy time. But any questions about writing or the book? Is that happy to share, help? Uh, yeah. What uh, What's the hardest part of uh, Augustine's life to write about? Hardest part is life to write about. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, he is endlessly fascinating. He, 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 even, you know, if I disagree with him at times. Um, the, uh, on the Domitus controversy, he ends up, um, we won't get into all about Domitus, this, this is called for, brief, for, for uh, brevity's sake, a purifying movement in the church who um, uh, Augustine saw as schismatic but not heretical. Unnecessarily dividing, but not heretics. Um, and Augustine eventually the first tries to use persuasion to bring them back in, but eventually gives the okay to the use of state force to to bring the Donatists back in and to, to criminalize or make illegal Donatist gatherings. So, and, and he can justify that by saying um, he uses illustrations like if, if someone's in a house and it's burning down. And they're whatever knocked out. The, you got to you have to break in the house sometimes and rescue them from harm. So you kind of use some ends justifies the means kind of um, justification. So that'd be part of the least savory of Augustine. Um, his life is fascinating, um, but probably just the Donatist aspect is probably the least savory of, of Augustine's life to, to read and study. Yeah. Uh, does Augustine get into like? So then you talked about the two columns and yeah. talking about the the end justifies the means thing. Does he dive into moral and ethical philosophy? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. And where and what writings? Sure. There? So he has a book, Damon Dacio online, and so for Augustine, lines always wrong. I mean, like always, 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 always wrong. So he um, he speaks explicitly there. He speaks explicitly about, of course, the nature of just war. It's not in one part of his writing. It's kind of spread all over it. Yeah, so um, certainly on war. Uh, on the city of God, he speaks something about um, the nature of civil government. So for Augustine, the civil government is not sinful, but it comes about due to sin. So it's an institution we see now after the fall. Okay, so... Uh, if you were to read the City of God, I think you would find all, most aspects of ethical theory, you know, maybe not according to modern standards, but most traditional aspects of concerns of ethics addressed somewhere, say, in the City of God. Here are a lot of letters um, that you can, um, New City Press is the up-to-date English translation. If you're going to start buying Augusta, I'll get the New City Press uh, that you can get it digitally and in print. Um, then you can search and all that, that kind of fun stuff. But uh, his letters, his sermons, uh, virtually uh, an endless source for ethical training. Other questions? The good, the bad, the ugly of Augustine. Yeah? So uh, my question is about the book itself. Yes. Is it written as a biography or are you going through the arguments and evaluating them? Yeah, that's good. So it's the title is well, yeah, is Augustine of Hippo, his life and impact. So essentially, the first I don't know, 15, 20, 20 something pages, 15, 20, is biography, uh, and then I tend to treat him in a little more topical fashion. And in the in the introduction, I lay out my goal is to uh, to be fair to him, um, but to engage him as Protestant, and so. I, I set up a schema, schemata of sorts where I say, I'm going to try to say, here's where Augustine, uh, or Protestant, is pretty much going to say, you know, kudos, Augustine, that's great. The second area, or second group of areas where, yeah, it'd be more questionable. Then a third group where Protestants just need to part ways, I think, with Augustine. So that's kind of informing the way I go through the book. The other, at least, interlocutor in my head, the person I'm engaging, is the Warfield quote of uh, um, uh, Augustine's, or the Reformation being the victory of Augustine's doctrine and grace of the doctrine of the church. So that's kind of going through my head as well. So um, one thing I found is interesting, he's, he's 
pretty quirky at places. And so you might think of Augustine simply as a proto-Calvinist, and certainly his theology is loved by Calvinists generally, but he um, is not quite as clean. It's not quite as clean as, say, Romans 8, kind of, you know, the way Calvinists will take Romans 8 and all, is uh, you can have baptism regeneration, which you do have. Uh, you can have a doctrine of perseverance, but not everyone who's regenerated is going to persevere, right? So where in, um, in say, Reformed theology and Protestant circles, you know, once there's real conversion, there's ultimately real perseverance, even though you have a hard time describing this, that challenge or whatever. Uh, Augustine's a little quirky on that. Um, it's not quite as clean as it might be in later Reformed theology. Other questions? Yep. How do you think that Augustine's early Manichaean faith influences his later Christian thought? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So um, the question so Augustine in the book I worked through the three key moments in his life. So great text students, you should know those. Okay. Um, one of those is Manichaeism. So he's a follower for some nine years. And Manichaeism, in essence, has a, has a good evil dualism. You've got some good evil eternal forces. And through their fighting and all, good evil ends up pervading all of reality. So it has a Gnostic flair to it in that creation is um, not good in essence, but, but bad in essence. So one of the ways that Manichaeism influences him is once he really becomes a Christian and begins to write, and of course his literary corpus is huge, he repeats, I mean, I, I, I don't know if we can count how many times he, he will speak explicitly to the goodness of creation. So one of the ways he responds to his own Manichaean background is by trying to shake free from it by explicitly, by, by affirming doggedly that creation is in essence good. Of course you know, I take you know the rest. It's so good in fact that evil is considered to be a privatio body or privation of good. So evil doesn't have the, the, um, the uh, trait of being a substance or a thing really. It's a privation of good such that if something became completely evil it would cease to exist lacked all its good, it would cease to exist. So he pretty radically tries to shake free from the Manichaean background. Another way I think he breaks free is just the centrality of the incarnation and the atonement. You Again, back to the De Trinitate, you only get to God through a bloody, earthy body and cross. Um, a Manichaean would, wouldn't speak in those terms. Um, of redemption being centered in a body, a bloody body, a death, etc. Um, so even if he wasn't uh, consistent in breaking free from his Manichaeism, he tries real hard. I think he probably breaks free from it more than... His Neoplatonism may kind of linger a bit more than his Manichaeism. That's my take. Other thoughts? Everything you want to know about Augustine, but we're afraid to ask. <laughs> yep, Stephen. Um, so now that you've got this book published, what's what's? Do you have an idea for what your next big project is going to be? Yeah, Where, yeah, that's yeah. nice, Stephen. So, I on Augustine. I'm I've got one chapter a year due on Augustine for uh, a book series edited by someone else. Um, Couple brothers, and I'm writing the Augustine chapter on. on uh, so, so I'm writing, trying to overdo, trying to finish now the chapter on sin, and then do the chapter on grace, perseverance, etc. Um, but what's really my gut? I like to write a biblical theology of knowledge. That's, uh, and you're getting some of that when I talk with you, with great text students. You're getting that. Um, wanting it will be influenced by Augustine, but also in the Bible, uh, and um, and I, I hope that to be a next serious monograph, um, scholarly study on the nature of knowledge, explicitly biblical 
perspective. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you for your time. I think we're near the end of questions, Dean, unless you have uh, another agenda or anything. That's it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.